Welcome to I Love to Tell the Story, a podcast on the Narrative Lectionary. I'm Rolf Jacobson. I'm Catherine Schiffedeke. And I'm Christopher Van Kaufman. And today we're talking about the readings for February 25th, 2024, from Mark 10, 32 through 52. And Mark 10 is part of the travel narrative in Mark. It is a much shorter narrative than we see, for, than, for instance, in the Gospel of Luke. But the first part of Mark... We are in Galilee and uh, some of the surrounding environs, as we've talked about, it's always important to see when Mark tells us about, for instance, crossing the Sea of Galilee. But here now we are going up to Jerusalem. We see that in 1032, on the road going up to Jerusalem. And we get another teaching about the passion. And we're going to talk about how it is slightly different than the two we've gotten before. We get James and John making an awkward request of Jesus and his response to them. And then finally, we end uh, this week with the story of blind Bartimaeus and his healing on the road to Jericho. Oh, actually, one more. uh, Before the story of blind Bartimaeus, we also have Jesus doing more teaching about what it means uh, for the Son of Man Uh, what his purpose is. So we've got a lot to cover in this week. Yeah, and if if you want to go with uh, a theme that we suggested uh, last week of uh, the upside-down kingdom, of course, uh, a lot of this uh, fits into it as last week as well, right? That uh, the uh, James and John want power, right? Uh, They want to sit at uh, Jesus' right hand and at his left, and they don't understand what that entails. Uh, The uh, um, you know to follow this suffering Messiah, Uh, even though Jesus has just told them, right? We're going over, uh, going to Jerusalem, um, and I'm going to be condemned to death uh, and handed over to the Gentiles. and so Jesus spells it out for them, right? Uh, whoever wants to, whoever wishes to become great among you must be your servant, and whoever wishes to be first among you must be slave of all. For the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve, and to give his life a ransom for many. So the uh, uh, power, authority, um, all of this rests on Jesus. We've seen that in the healing stories. Um and that that same power uh, he's given to the disciples in terms of healing, uh, uh, we saw that in the sending out of of the disciples, uh, and and yet they still don't understand that here power and authority uh, have to do with service, have to do with being a servant of all. So upside down kingdom, or however you want to say that, uh, would be a, a, this this would be a, a good text to talk about. Um, uh, to to talk about what that means uh, to be a follower of Jesus. So you've got this middle section of John, of John Mark. This is Gospel of Mark, Roth. Uh, from Mark 8.22 uh, through the end of chapter 10, which is right before the triumphal ending. And you get in this passage, you, you get Mark 8.22, Jesus cures a blind man at Bethsaida. Mm-hmm. And this is the only miracle that Jesus has to do twice. He, he he cures this blind man and he goes, can you see? He goes, I see people, but they look like trees walking. <laughs> and so he does it again, right? And then you get this middle part where the disciples are learning to see mm-hmm. who Jesus is. They see he's the, they see he is the Christ. Right. Peter they is. connect him with the, that, oh, he's the son of God. That's a transfiguration. They're, they get the three explanations of what it means for him to be Messiah. They understand that their own three sets of what it will be like are wrong. Peter, no, I won't let that happen. Uh, which one of us is the greatest? And then which one of us gets to sit at your right hand? I mean, so so their undoing of their expectations, they're learning to see. And then it ends with this blind man who knows better than they do. Mm -hmm. What's really interesting to me is they're walking along and the blind man is sitting by the road. And when he heard that it was Jesus, he began to shout. He knows who he is. Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. I mean, Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that the blind man here can see better than they can. Uh, That's an easy sort of 
rhetorical move to make. There's lots of songs about this, you know, mm -hmm. I mean, that make that kind of thing. But I do think the fact that he urgently shouts and then he gets up and doesn't he get up and run? Um, I can't remember. And yeah, he springs up. Yeah, he, he jumps up. You know, yeah. he, the eagerness there that uh, again, and then you get, like we said, your faith has saved you. Mm -hmm. uh, and yeah. Again, that, that trust is the way we receive these promises and this grace and forgiveness and power from God. And I think this is a great example. We talked about the way in which Mark likes to retell stories or likes to tell stories again with a different twist. We saw this with the transfiguration where it in many ways echoed Jesus' baptism with an Elijah figure and a voice from heaven, but again, in slightly different ways. This is so interesting because, especially starting at about verse 47, in the way that this story uses the same language that Jesus that is used when Jesus casts out a demon in the first chapter of Mark. Mm. The demon knows who Jesus is and Jesus sternly orders the demon to be quiet. But in this case, when Bartimaeus knows who Jesus is, it's the crowd around who tries to take on that sternly ordering, but Jesus instead calls him. And so again, we get that same interesting thing where earlier Jesus did not allow who he was to be known. And here he does. Because, and then the next scene is the, the entry into, the, I mean, mm -hmm. his hour has come. Exactly. It's part of it. Mm -hmm. And part of it is, I mean, it, this this continues the theme. Uh, where is it that in the text that they start to tell him, um, Many sternly ordered him to be quiet. Yep. I'd love to compare uh, that. Oh, but, oh, I got it's the same. The same Greek word to rebuke him. The epitemao. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, and and um, that's fantastic. But now it's it is his hour. He's ready to go. Oh, but one more thing about the um, the blindness and the and the um, disciples are beginning to see. But some of the other characters see more clearly, and that is Jairus. Uh, Jairus is, this has nothing to do, and this is such an incredible stretch, I expect to be scoffed at. In <laughs> fact, I'm inviting it, which is Jairus in Hebrew means he enlightens. It's the Hiphiel name. He causes light to be. Has nothing to do with anything, but I just wanted to say that. <laughs> yeah. Well, and I mean, there's these ways in which Mark wants you to see that characters who you may not expect to get it. Yeah. Jairus, Bartimaeus, get it. And characters who should, James and John, Peter, don't. I mean, there's the irony is so yep. great in Mark 51. What does Bartimaeus call Jesus? My teacher. There you go. He mm -hmm. is the one. Jesus has been trying to teach the disciples. If you remember back, we talked disciple actually means a learner or a student. Mm -hmm. These students who can't learn, Jesus has been trying to teach them. And Bartimaeus is finally the one who gets it. Yeah, people want to keep children away from Jesus. They want to keep, uh, you know, um, beggars. Beggar, uh, but here's uh, yeah, here's a blind beggar. Got to right. keep him away. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's yeah. that whole undoing of the. There's certainly an undoing of the, of the cleanliness stuff mm -hmm. going on. That mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. the God who comes to us in Jesus is not afraid of, um, our impurities. So I'm curious. Uh, this messianic secret. I, I don't know if you guys address this because uh, I wasn't part of all the podcast on Mark, but uh, well, why? Why doesn't Jesus want, is it just a matter of timing? Like now, now that he's ready to enter into Jerusalem, it's all right to um, be known as the Messiah or any answers? Well, I'll, <laughs> I'll say one thing and then Christopher will give us the definitive answer. <laughs> all right. My teacher, Beverly Gaventa, way back said, all of the explanations of what it means are utterly unconvincing to her. She just doesn't understand it. So, I say, so but, it's just a mystery. Well, I mean, I think um, Vreda was in it. Vreda that the first named Vreda, it yeah. the messianic secret, and and um, his explanation is ridiculous. But I think it's just got because now he's ready. And mm -hmm. they go in, and the the, the stones themselves must proclaim it, you know, yeah. shortly. Yeah, so yeah. I think it's that's the simplest explanation, don't you think, Christopher? Yeah, I think though that one of the difficulties that people have with under with thinking about this is the fact that they expect 
and Matthew and Luke condition us to expect this. They expect characters in Mark's narrative to understand much more than they do. That one of the things that Mark thematizes throughout up to this point, really, is the lack of understanding of what people, of people, that people have of Jesus. And one of the ways in which this uh, functions is it functions in some ways as a narrative playing out of Jesus's quotation of Isaiah in Mark 4. Oh. Mm -hmm. That part of Jesus's identity is to be obscurant, is to be misunderstood. And that this is a thing that Mark really wants to push on is the way in which these other people who later will claim to have understood who Jesus is, Peter especially, Mark wants to push back and say that, in fact, that they did not understand. And we see that throughout uh, Mark 1, really 1 through 10. Mm. And Peter, of course, uh, when we get to the Passion, will continue to not understand. But I I, uh, I want to go to th – thank you. Thank you for answering that, both of you. Uh, when uh, John and James, uh, you know, come to Jesus and say, we want to sit at your right hand and at your left, and he, he says, um, are you able to drink the cup that I drink or be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with? They replied, we are able. And Jesus says, you will drink of the cup that I drink. Uh, and will be baptized with the baptism with which I am baptized. Later, uh, and we'll be talking about this uh, as we get closer to uh, Easter, but uh, in Gethsemane, right, he says, uh, this is chapter 14, 36, he, sa he said, Abba, Father, for you all things are possible. Remove this cup from me, yet not what I want, but what you want. There's... Uh, the, uh, I assume an illusion there, uh, uh, or maybe a foregrounding or uh, foretelling of that, that the cup is one of suffering, right? And the baptism is baptism into death, uh, and then, of course, into life as well. Uh, so that James and John don't understand what they're asking for, really. Mm. <laughs> and they say, uh, maybe too quickly or too confidently, we're able, and of course, uh, tradition has it that they were. I mean, after after the after Easter, they do become, um, die for the sake of the gospel, um, uh, and and more important. I mean, just as importantly, proclaim the gospel uh, in their uh, before they die. Uh, but that that here uh, they're saying more than they more than they understand. Um, and so, as we talk about again the the theme of the upside down kingdom, that uh, this power, uh, uh, this kingdom is one uh, of suffering uh, for the sake of the gospel, um, and and it's uh, taking up your cross, as we talked about uh, in previous weeks, um, but not for the sake of the suffering, not for the sake of the cross, but uh, to, to be raised up through that death into new life.